Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Sarah. It's another Tuesday. It's another author interview. It's another day that I am happy to be with you. I am very happy to be with you to talk about books. I am less happy about the heat. It's not even that hot here. Let me preface this. I know that there's heat waves going on in a lot of places and they are incredibly hot. And I have lived in places that are incredibly hot. I've lived in Texas. I've lived in California. Both places can get much, much hotter than it is here right now. But I don't know. It's it's not even that humid, but um, our apartment just does not cool down right now. And so I've been very grumpy about the heat the last few days. And I know I shouldn't be because it could be so very much worse. But um, yeah little grumpy, but it's okay. This too shall pass. We are going to London this weekend. Very excited about that. I've never been. I've always wanted to go. You know, I'm a little bit of an Anglophile, so I'm really looking forward to that, but also it's supposed to be a little bit cooler. I shouldn't say that out loud because as soon as I say that out loud, it's, you know, it's going to just jump up the temperature while we're there. But anyway, enough talk about the weather. Let's talk about a book instead. In particular, let's talk about the book Reggaeton Cruise by Patricio X. Maya. He is my guest today. This is his debut novel. It is not the first thing that he has written for publication, but it is his debut novel. And let me go ahead and give you the description of this novel. After getting nearly crushed on his way to Magic America, the migrant drifter most likely to fail posts a song that blows up on YouTube. Cringe factor is part of the vile charm. The flashy farmer must be a joke. But maybe he's the opposite of a joke. He'll sort that out for himself when he performs his smash hit at the flamboyant reggaeton cruise, which, thanks to the subversive forces in the mainland, might be a gig to die for. Literally. Thrown into the fray are three affluent Japanese sisters who'd signed up for Disneyland, not the Battle of Fallujah, an Estonian gamer groomed by the U.S. Army to draw foreign blood, an Ecuadorian jock with a chip on his shoulder reaching all the way back to Torrid Guayaquil, a Liberian refugee gone real estate investor with a gospel to tell, and a potty mouth Salvadoran pupusero who serves as an unlikely moral arbiter from afar. Patricio X. Maya's characters may be from all over, but they're all cut up in a single net of immeasurable proportions. This net is our common destiny, of course, our plot, capitalism, globalization, and hyperreality. Whether we cry or laugh or decide to get mad, Reggaeton Cruz audaciously decodes the hologram of itself that much of the world has become. Well, if that doesn't intrigue you, I'm not sure what will. I mean, there are so many different elements in this book. It actually starts out um, when you're reading it. If you didn't, if you if you didn't have a clue what it was about, if you didn't read that blurb, if you didn't read the back of the book or know what you're getting into, the first chapter reads almost like YA post-apocalyptic f- fiction. That's just the feeling that the, the feeling that I had when I was reading the first chapter. That's about the gamer, and it is it, it's set in current, you know, modern day Estonia. But for some reason, it felt like this kid was living in a world that seemed very kind of post apocalyptic, which says a lot about what's going on in this book. And then the next chapter talks about the the character that is in Ecuador, who is who travels to America, who has the viral hit Delphine. And his 
reads like you've gone back in time because he has a very agrarian upbringing. It's not the same with the level of social media that we're all used to or the level of technology that we're all used to. And so it feels like you've gone from this sort of futuristic apocalyptic world back in time. And you might be thinking, what am I reading? But it's all set in contemporary. It's all set in the same time period. And it's just fascinating the way Patricio weaves all of the stories together and weaves all of the characters together so that they eventually come together in this one spot and create this plot and I don't want to give too much away and I want to let him talk about it as well but just fascinating the the different levels that are present in this book not only with the storylines but with the characters with the number of um nationalities that are in there all of the different languages that are spoken throughout the book yeah, I, I could I could go on about the, the fascinating layers, but I'm going to let Patricio talk about his work. And so let's turn to that interview again. The book is called Reggaeton Cruise. The author is Patricio X. Maya. Hi, Patricio. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about writing and about your books. Before we get to um, the book, let's talk about you a little bit. Can you share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you a little bit better? Sure. Uh, my name is Patricio X. Maya. I was born in uh, Quito, Ecuador, and where I spent uh, about a decade and two years. And then I moved to California, where I was, uh, went to high school. Um, and then I graduated high school. I majored in English, um, had a, went to UC Berkeley for a little bit and dropped out of Berkeley. I wasn't ready. And then I went to uh, Cal State LA, CSU LA, where I majored in English, creative writing. Um, and then I decided to pursue a master's um, at Syracuse University uh, in arts journalism, which is um, essentially arts criticism. So I did that. I graduated in about, I think, 2009, just around the time of the Great uh, Recession, which wasn't a good time to graduate. And also newspapers were folding left and right. Um, so I didn't really do too much journalism. I did some criticism, some theater stuff, um, some musical theater. Actually, I ended up reviewing a lot of that. Uh, some pieces about photography and so on. But uh, my career has mostly been in teaching now. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. I'm a a community college instructor um and yeah i teach writing uh, but i also teach spanish and i have a very full plate nowadays i am i'm doing sociology as well so it's uh quite a wide variety of subjects that i'm teaching and and i write you know i've always i've always been creative uh either uh poetry essays um and the novel also so that's pretty much a little bit about my autobiography I love tennis. Um, in terms of teaching, are the, where we're starting to come out of the pandemic and going back to, I don't know that we'll ever go back to normal life, but are you teaching in person? Are you still teaching mostly online? Uh, it's, it's hybrid at this point. So I go to school once a week uh, where I meet with students, uh, but mostly online uh, next semester will be, I've been told, the, f the first semester where I'm going to teach, um, you know, face-to-face -face live. Uh, and that's going to be a big change because now I've gotten used to teaching from home and, uh, you know, not wearing necessarily like, uh, you know, uh, the attire that I would wear to go to school. So that's going to be interesting not to, it's just going to be a change. But I'm glad to go finally go back to the classroom next semester. Um, I do miss that, you know, so um, it just makes for a completely different energy when you teach that way. Yeah, I can imagine you might want to put a post-it note on your front door that says, are you wearing pants? Make sure, you know, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm very much looking forward to, you know, high-fiving students if they say something right or, yes. you know, uh, making them, uh, making sure that they're there uh, looking at you as opposed to with the little cameras where. Exactly. Um, you know, you're never sure if that's like a, I don't know, like a picture that they put there or something, you know. Right. Well, even when it's in person, it's hard. I find on like Zoom because I want, I'm looking at the person's 
picture and not the picture, but you know, their video. So I'm looking at them, but I'm not looking at the camera. So I'm not making eye contact. It's right. It's yeah. And, I, and I've read some uh, newspaper articles that cite some studies that say that it is uh, measurably more tiring, uh, you know, working online. So it's it really that, yeah. higher, you know, so uh, who knows, but it's just a different experience. And I think, you know, at this point, I'm going to end up uh, doing both for, you know, for the rest of my teaching, uh, as long as I teach, I think, I don't think it's going to go away. The, and think, it does yeah. have a lot of benefits, you know, as well. So. Agreed. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, well, let's, let's transition into uh, yeah. talking about the book now. Uh, it's called Reggaeton Cruise. Can you give an overview of the story? So, you know, it's interesting that we're talking about the uh, world of online teaching, because the book is, is a complex sort of narrative with many voices. Uh, but I think uh, the theme would be related to the, the idea of the modern world, the contemporary world, and how the sort of um, edges between that which is real and that which is sort of fictional, or at least, you know, disembedded from reality in the sense that you're wearing this like kind of computer cloud that takes, uh, you know, more and more of our existence, uh, then it becomes a sort of reality that's not reality, it's hyper reality, it's, uh, the, you know, internet reality and whatnot. So, uh, so the book is about that, it's about a video gamer. Uh, that's one of the characters who happens to become instru an instrumental uh, U.S. Army uh, element who works with drones and, and, and who goes, uh, who through gaming becomes, uh, enters the world of um, the most sort of powerful struggles in terms of um, uh, s national safety. So that's one of the characters. And another of the characters is an, an immigrant from the Andes who uh, comes up through through Mexico, through Central America, and makes it to the United States, and is able to sort of improve his life and also enter the world of um, that that sort of cloud, that hyper real parallel world that, that we all sort of live in with social media. He 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 becomes a famous um, a famous viral star because he puts up a music video. Uh, on YouTube and somehow people, for some reason, people like it, even though the video is not what one expects to be like excellence. They like it in a sort of ironic way. Anyway, these two, essentially these two teenagers have parallel uh, plots in which they are on a course to sort of clash. And that's the whole, and the novel is built around that with uh, all the people they meet and, uh, and they finally have their encounter when they, uh, in the reggaeton cruise, which is uh, the, central to the novel. So that's that's what I would say in terms of uh, theme and, and characters and plot a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we return, we'll be talking more about the contrasts that Patricio was just mentioning and how those play out in the characters and in the books. And I alluded to this a little bit uh, at the beginning, but we'll talk more about it when we return. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or any where you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Patricio X. Maya about his debut novel, Reggaeton Cruise. Let's go ahead and return to that interview. That um, that contrast between, the, you were talking about, you know, life in the cloud and being online and social media, the, the contrast in the first especially the first three chapters are is really interesting because you get the the teenager who is the gamer very much connected to the online world you have the three sisters who are uh, very much connected to social media and then you have the the immigrant who who eventually does go viral but when we first meet him he's living a very simple life very um agrarian no social media no computer nothing um so that contrast at the beginning i thought was really interesting uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, the I think I I wanted to show you know that that idea of the of the network. Um, so we all live in a, a sort of network that is connected. You know the web, and not necessarily like the online web, like the internet, though also the internet. Uh, but you know that web of uh, let's say airports. You know that connects us all. Uh, once we start traveling, you know. Uh, web of uh, freeways, uh, web countries, passports, all this kind of international globalized uh, reality that we live in. Uh, Delphine Kishpe, the the rural Ecuadorian immigrant who who, le- who uh, uh, leaves his mountain town uh, after his father's death, has a very different reality. He's not connected to the uh, you know globalized networks yet, um, but life is such that it just takes a few steps. Uh, in his case, a lot of steps for him to reach that uh, reality, that hyper reality that we seem to live in today. Once he steps in, he's just he's just another another member, you know. But uh, I think I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to show that how people from such different uh, backgrounds, whether it be the Furukawa sisters who are wealthy and are traveling and having a lot of fun, uh, and are always on social media, photogram, as I call it in the in the novel, and Delphine, who wants to migrate and eventually migrates through, you know, a lot of toil, toil, um, and then you know the Arjun Parn, who's the the gamer, who's in Estonia, um, and he has a very different situation. He game, he's a sort of star gamer, um, you know. They eventually meet, as we all do meet. Uh, in some way or another uh, in this world um, that is so connected, you know, with um, I, some of the people that have helped me uh, and my editor with the book are not in the United States. So, you know, we, they have been, for example, we have a, a, a person who's helping us with um, design, who designed the book. She was in, in France, but she was Italian. And God knows what her story was, you know. So we have, that's just the reality of uh, today's reality. I wanted to portray some of that in the book. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Was that your initial inspiration or what was your jumping off point for this uh, book? Yeah, so it was a sense of feeling, you know, that um, also how wide the reach that we all have today, uh, in terms, well, on a personal level, um, being that I'm uh, was born in Ecuador and I, I pay a lot of attention to the news down there, um, and also the news here and the news elsewhere. So I had this feeling of being connected to a very wide uh, net. Um, at the at the time, well, a few years ago, I was an ESL English as a second language teacher, um, and a lot of my students would tell me stories from like Mongolia, you know, and then. Uh, I lived in in Koreatown in LA, and uh, it was an extremely cosmopolitan reality, um, and that I wanted to. So it does reflect a lot of my personal experience, uh, but somehow it clicked uh, at some point uh, when I I, I watched the uh, viral video of this rural uh, Native uh, American Ecuadorian who had gone actually viral because he posted in the hispanic world it was one of the first viral videos uh because he posted a a a kind of song that was very uh sort of haphazardly made but people took to it and he became a he literally toured and you know uh there was a documentary made about him and i'm like oh my god you know what if i incorporated a sort of fictionalized reality uh version of this 
guy's uh, voyage. And then you, uh, you, I knew some stories uh, from being in L.A. and whatnot. And somehow it all came together uh, in my subconscious. It, I made it work. But it was mostly a feeling that I wanted to to show the networks, you know, in in their progression towards something. Uh, they seem to be moving, you know. Um, I, it's hard to say exactly how it happened, but it, I just uh, I threw all these elements in there and see how they how they worked. Mm -hmm. And and so with what you're saying within with the network and showing the connections at, that are so present throughout this book, mm -hmm. it it makes so, it makes a lot of sense for you to write it from the many different points of view that you do. Was it that ever hard to keep track of, or did you think about writing it from fewer perspectives? How did that work in terms of your writing process? Um, I think it was probably you know believe it or not uh, easier. I, I might have like a kind of. I think if I if I stuck to a single perspective, I might have been more self conscious, because uh, it would have been my voice, you know. As a kind of first time novelist, um, I, I like the fact that I could sort of hide behind my characters and let them talk. Um, so in that sense, I think I had the need from uh, I think having met so many people, uh, you know, throughout my life. Even though I'm not uh, old yet, I, I have had a a rather very uh, extensive uh, just set of experiences. Um, and I think I wanted to portray some of that. And being that English is not my first language, uh, I've always heard, and somebody told me this uh, when I was at Syracuse, uh, a professor of mine said that, you know, non-native speaker writers tend to love to experiment with the sort of uh, mechanics of language or like the plasticity of the language. Um, he mentioned Nab Nab Nabokov and, and whatnot and uh, other writers that are not native um, speakers. And I think I do feel a sense of that, you know, a sense of kind of, OK, well, it's not my native language. So I, I just want to see the limits of it, you know, um, and with different characters, different voices, different accents. Uh, it was a way to just bring all of that stuff together. It was a a challenge at some points because some stories wanted to keep telling themselves or rather go on and I knew that they couldn't go on for uh, too long so I had to cut uh, make some uh, deep uh, sizable cuts you know like some of the chapters were like 30 or 40 pages longer and uh, you know they were turning into their own novels and I really didn't want that I wanted to be cohesive uh, so that was a challenge you know having a good scene but you knew that it was going on for too long and it was like okay uh, you know delete and it was like 20 pages so uh that's a lot of days worth of work yeah i can only imagine how difficult that must be to have those stories and and know you have to cut some out um even though you've written them they're kind of like family at that point <laughs> but you have yeah. to you have to call some of it um so i know that you write in both english and spanish um how i have so many questions i don't I, i'm not actually even sure where to start but um do you write the same things in English and Spanish or do you write differently in English and Spanish? I mean, do you hmm. like, like, is this think, book, did you write this book in both English and Spanish and how did that work for you? Well, I don't think I could have written this book in Spanish. It's been translated. Um, so by, by a, by a professional translator from Venezuela at the, at the moment, um, I, I thought about translating it myself, but I just wanted to move on. Uh, and do something else. And I don't think I'll ever sort of translate myself. It's, it seems odd. But, um, you know, I do, I write differently, I think, in Spanish and English, because my sort of experiences have been different. Um, I think I, I couldn't, I couldn't have written this, this particular book in English, in Spanish. Um, because, well, English is the global language. So there's a, there's a sense of, of you know, that global, global um, version of it or that global reality uh, but also I, I tend to be different and my Spanish seems to be more uh, sort of um, more local more local more family oriented more polite even I sound more polite in, in Spanish I think I'm much more sort of uh, I, I was educated in the United States so there's a sense of the the uh, the the child in me is always more sort of closer to the Spanish 
Uh, so I, a lot of, I, I tend to write a lot of poetry in Spanish. Um, and so the influences are different, actually, you know, in terms of who influences my writing. So uh, in, in the poetry, I, I hear Neruda, I hear Borges, I hear a lot of the kind of Latin American writers. Um, and then in, in English, I, it's, it's much more experimental. And um, I hear other, other writers, other, perhaps even the uh, California writer, William Saroyan and all of these other, other writers that are uh, present in my, in my English, Bolaño and whatnot. So anyway, that's, I think there's two different worlds. Um, Sometimes people ask me, what do you do? So you're like, you're one of the few people who are ne nearly native in both languages, you know, um, in terms of my accent or my, my fluidity. And I say, well, the way I do it, it's because there's two separate chambers in my, my brain and I just access different ones, uh, access them at different times. Um, but, you know, when I'm tired or, or something and they sort of, and I, and they start mixing then it becomes a very, a very different uh, sort of thing, you know? So I guess that's sort of an answer. <laughs> no, that's really fascinating, actually. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by language anyway, but there's also a variety of languages represented in this book from um, yeah. Spanish, English, Italian, Japanese, yeah. more of than that than just those. So um, do you... First, how many languages do you speak, even just a little? And then how much research did you do in terms of the languages that you used? Um, okay, so, uh, you know, they say write what you know, and there's a lot of truth to that. But, you know, sometimes we like to go a little farther than that, uh, than what we know. Uh, I, well, I'm, I speak English, Spanish, uh, Portuguese uh, pretty, pretty well, though I've forgotten um, uh, Portuguese because I used to have a lot of friends from, from Brazil and uh, because of the nature of, of, you know, migration and whatnot, people come and go and, and stuff. So my Portuguese, I would love to practice more, but I can read, uh, you know, and I can write uh, mo more reading than writing and speaking. I can get by. And then my wife is Japanese and I'm learning a lot of Japanese. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't put it on my resume yet. Um, but, uh, but I do know that if I went to Japan and I wanted to say, uh, you know, I'm hungry, feed me, or I'm cold, you know, an emerge. I could probably get by in, in an emergency. I have uh, a lot of phrases, a lot of sentences, and there, and I'm adding vocabulary. So one day, knock on wood, I will be uh, fluent in Japanese. So I have a lot of interest in language, just too. Um, I've taken Korean classes, uh, but that was a, a failed experiment. Someday, I, I, I would love to go to back to, to taking more Korean classes. Interestingly enough, life gives you stuff, you know, uh, because if it were up to me and it, my, my wife probably wouldn't like me to say this because uh, I'm, I'm paying a lot of attention to Japanese now. But if it were up to me, the languages that I would like to learn would be uh, Russian and Mandarin, Chinese. So I have never had the opportunity because you, you take what life, uh, life throws at you. So life has uh, thrown at me English. I was actually a mediocre English student. Uh, in Ecuador, when I was, uh, you know, in, as, a, as a as a kid, as a kid, and I ended up becoming an English teacher. So I grabbed the English because that was given to me. But and now I'm grabbing Japanese. But uh, you, we don't get our choice necessarily. <laughs> yeah, it really does depend on what what where life takes you. So that's that is fascinating. Exactly. Time for the second break of the podcast. When we come back, Patricio will be talking about types of research that he did for the books and the situations that happen within the book. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. 
Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Patricio X. Maya. Let's get back to that interview. In terms of other types of research, did you do much for the book or did you kind of draw on your own experiences for um, the storyline? I did a lot of research. I did research. Um, not so much in terms of like anything except for one chapter because there's a chapter where, so there's a sort of terrorist organization in the, in the book the Coalition of the Eager, which uh, is a nightmare terrorist organization in the sense, or, well, yeah, it is a terrorist organization. It's, it's, I even struggle with the terminology, but um, they are the kind of nightmare scenario that somebody mentioned somewhere, and I don't know where, but I picked it up and I thought, like, that was genius. So, like, the, the thing that, that I read about was that what would happen is, like, the more sort of uh, radical and dissatisfied elements from both sides of the political spectrum in the United States. What if, if both sides of those, uh, of that, of, of those, of that spectrum actually um, coalesced into like a dissatisfied uh, third force, you know? Uh, and I thought, wow, that's a perfect nightmare scenario for fiction. Uh, though that seems to have ruffled some feathers I've gotten like, notes emails uh by by uh readers saying no that's that would never happen well you know it's fiction uh but anyway in order to write that that manifesto that the coalition has um it uh, i had to do a lot of research and step into that language uh there's a whole chapter that's pretty much the manifesto and it's a the language is completely different and i had i was at my most academic as that I've ever been it wasn't like an ima- it was an imaginative process but it was mostly like the language is academic and completely different from anything else that, that's in the book and I had to do a lot of reading a lot of stepping into like that uh, that kind of lingo um, and then you know I had to look up uh, like the helicopter uh, there's a helicopter that is uh, prominent towards the end of the book in which the uh, Arjun Parn is taken um, to to um, to and from places to an American prison somewhere. Um, I don't mind giving away the plot, uh, but you know, so I had to look up like what helicopter do they use? And uh, you know, actually I ended up learning quite a bit about helicopters and drones and drones. I, I, I looked up names of drones and how they, how they work and the, um, the, on, the, the uses of drones, which are not always commercial. Sometimes they're military and it's different, you know, so. There's a good book on that put out by the New York Times. It's a collection of articles that they have done on drones. So I, I did listen to an audiobook on drones and a lot of other research uh, rituals. You know, uh, the one of the, the Ecuadorian uh, Delphine who migrates is all central in the book. I did a lot of sort of reading up on the... So some of my experiences too, but my experiences were not his uh, in many ways. So I did look up a lot of rituals uh, by the indigenous population down there. Um, and, you know, I, I, and some stuff that I knew from my own uh, experience um, seeing things. So, you know, I just, I would say that I complemented my, some of the stuff that I kind of had a feeling for. And I, just to make it more tangible, I, I looked up a lot of stuff, like a lot of stuff on religion, like uh, Andean and religions from the Andes and, and whatnot. And how about your characters? Did you have um, a pretty good idea of the the characters before you started writing, or did they evolve as you wrote? Did you mm. create any as you wrote because of where the story yeah. was going? I, I created a few. So I had a, the the main sort of characters. I knew that uh, you know how I want them. I wanted them to be so. 
Mm, but they they evolve, you know. So I knew that one of the I wanted one of them to be a gamer from Europe, because somewhere I read, uh, and you know how these things happen. You read something, and then like ten years later, it appear it's like it 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 appears in, as an idea in your fiction. So uh, I had read somewhere that um, that Estonia, though it might have been Slovenia, you know, but it doesn't matter at this point. Uh, that uh, Estonia had a kind of uh, really uh, good internet uh, sort of um, industry, a kind of parallel, um, how do you call it, Silicon Valley, right? And um, and so I knew I knew I wanted my character to be from Europe, um, and I didn't know how I was going to make him. So I I knew a few things about him, and then when I started writing, it he took uh, a kind of body and soul of his own. Um, I did have to make some changes. Like there's a character, uh, Alvo, who's one of the uh, Japanese girls' uh, boyfriends, uh, who's the tennis player guy. And he was like, I was making him too much like myself at some point, like my voice, you know. Um, and I knew that I wanted him to have certain elements of who I am or some aspects of, of me. But, but that side, that took over the character in a way that it was like, not conducive to the story because uh, it just wasn't the right voice. So I, so I had to like rewrite that chapter. I want to say like two times until I found his voice. And even today, I'm not completely satisfied with that character's sort of persona because um, I don't know, he's kind of like a quilt of uh, people that I know. And it, it's, it's not as coalesced as I wanted him to be. But yeah, just to answer your question, so some of the characters I knew, another I knew that I wanted uh, to come out in in a certain way. Other characters are were completely took me by surprise. When Delphine is coming up to the to the United States, he runs into a former guerrilla fighter from Honduras who'd fought in Cuba uh, with alongside Fidel Castro. And that character, who turns out to be one of the most sort of um, most likable characters, especially in the audiobook, which uh, is being recorded now, the guy who's doing the audiobook is having so much fun with that character. Um, that well, that character anyway is I had no ex I just wanted him to meet some interesting uh, characters throughout the way, but he said like, you know what, I'm gonna take like a good ten pages of the novel, and I am like, okay, here you go. You know, so that character wrote itself. I don't know where it came from, um, but it's it it's like that. You know, so a lot of the I wouldn't say a lot of the peripheral characters or secondary characters were took uh, appeared by themselves. Sandrita, the that comes out and later in the story, she uh, is uh, was a kind of secondary character and became almost like a a main character through the force of her language and whatnot. She there must have been some inspiration for her, but at the now that I think about it, I, I can see. But when I started writing, it was just like, oh my God, this woman is just completely self-possessed and whole as a voice. And who knows where it comes from? I am fascinated by the concept of the audiobook because that mm -hmm. narrator has to do not only so many different voices, but different, um, different accents, different, <laughs> just, yeah. wow, I am, I'm, I'm already amazed by the narrator and I haven't even heard any of it. This guy is, is amazing. Graydon Miller, uh, my friend, good friend, uh, who's an actor also. So that helps. Um, but yeah, you know, he's done so many accents for the, for this book and we wanted to go a little bit theatrical, not in the negative sense, but a little bit kind of, lift up the kind of drama and as opposed to just being a, a, a red book there's an element of acting in it and he's done he's doing a great job but it's taken a lot longer than we thought it would so we are almost done with the audiobook that's exciting yeah. how about um what are you working on now are you working on a new project yeah so i i've had you know the, so that when i wrote this novel reggaeton cruise it kind of uh, was very um, uh, fluid in the way that it just came out easily and I thought well 
now all my books are going to come out like that. And, you know, but I was wrong. <laughs> so I, I started a couple projects and then I didn't really, I, they weren't going in the direction that I wanted them to go in terms of the language. Um, and so I, I dropped a couple of, I've had some false starts, uh, but now I think I, I, I have started something that's going to stick. Uh, and yeah, I'm working on a sort of detective novel uh, of uh, related to FIFA, which is a soccer world, uh, football or soccer uh, organization. And it has to do with um, African children being brought into Europe to become soccer players. Um, and it has to do with a sort of... Um, exploitation and also a lot of the themes are there so global 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 networks of exploitation and um also having a, a third party who comes in as a detective to uh solve uh those issues you know so it anyway has to do with world soccer and uh criminal networks related to world soccer and a detective who happens to be an Ecuadorian American like myself written in Spanish. Oh, interesting. Um, it, it, I was kind of laughing when you were first talking about you know, the, the reggaeton cruise sort of writing itself. It's books are kind of like children where, you know, you have an easy first one and you think, ah, I got this parenting thing down. <laughs> and then uh, Somebody should have told me that. Because I was under the impression that, you know, it would just be like, okay, sit down. No, it's not. It's, it's toil. It's work. And uh, time for our final break of the podcast. When we come back, Patricio will be talking about some of his other writings. This is his debut novel, but he has written um, a collection of essays and poetry. And so we'll be talking about some of those. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Patricio X. Maya. So this is uh, Reggaeton Cruise is your first novel, but you've done other writings. Are there any other writings, maybe in terms of your poetry or anything like that, you, that you would like to highlight? Um, yeah. So, and, you know, it brings me to a completely different kind of reader. Uh, so I have a book of poems that I, that was published uh few years ago I want to say like three four years ago um, and that is just uh, it's a, a collection of poems in Spanish it's called 80 miles per hour per hour uh, 80 number 80 uh, m uh, miles per hour mph uh, and that has a different kind of readership uh, from completely different in terms of language and whatnot so I have some readers in Argentina and Chile and whatnot um, and then the other book that uh, was published is the one that sold the most uh, is the a collection of essays walking around with Fantian Bukowski, which is a collection of the critical work that I've done in terms of mostly photography, but also a little bit of work that on uh, political bloggers around the world. And um, yeah, so those those book of essays in English, uh, walking around with Fantian Bukowski. Uh, which is critical essays some, a little, with a little reporting. Um, and then the for those of you who speak Spanish, the 80 miles per hour, uh, 80 millas por hora. Um, that's, the, that's, that's, that's what I'd like to, to highlight. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
In terms of writing, obviously you've you've written in various capacities throughout your career, but what what was the impetus, the final decision that made you decide to write for publication, whether that was poetry or essays or this novel? To communicate, I guess, with with other people because I think a lot of writers, well, I'll just and I'll speak for myself. There's a sense of, you know, you're, you think a lot and there's a, an element of neuroticism and creativity that uh, goes hand in hand. Um, so sometimes the, uh, some of that uh, self, uh, self-inflicted self uh, obstacles that, that you give that you give yourself, you know, like, oh, what is, you ask yourself a big question, you know, what is globalization actually? And so, you know, thinking about that in your day to day as you're going to work or you know, and being able to to communicate, first of all, to put it on paper to, as a creative thing, uh, and then having other people read it and tell you, oh, I, I, I get what you're saying, or it impacts me, or it, uh, it uh, or just starting a conversation with, with readers, um, it really uh, is something else that I, that I, that I wanted to do. And so uh, my, my publisher came in, it's a small Hollywood publisher uh, but you know as small as it may be having somebody kind of help you with the with the publishing and, and spreading the word about your book and helping you with readings and interviews setting up interviews and all of that stuff is uh, something that has really helped so wanting to communicate wanting to talk to people and start conversations with the language and perspective with it that I that I know and that I wanted so you know Somebody might bring that perspective of the globalized world from a completely different uh, place or with different dynamics, different language. So when I'm proposing, when I have a book, I say, well, let's have a conversation about this. But, you know, the terms laid out on the table are the ones that come, at least initially, from the book. And that is something that I really... I really love that having those conversations uh, about stuff that I'm interested in already. From your experience, then, do you have advice for aspiring authors, and especially in your case, maybe bilingual aspiring authors? Oh, that's a that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I used to I was in a poetry uh, when I was writing poetry as a teenager. I, I took a poetry class. And the, the poetry um, teacher said something that, that we, it was a Spanish poetry class. And he said, you know, uh, I, I do have a little English, but I feel like it kind of, it's, it takes up my, it takes up too much room. So I would rather just focus on a single language. Um, and then, you know, I, I understood what he was saying. Uh, but at the same time for bilingual writers, I would say, Mm, find your voice uh, and and make and, and write. Don't be. Don't try to sound like anybody else because I think writers in general uh, are going to sound different from one another. Uh, but in particular, for those of you who are bilingual, I would say, uh, or mo- or speak multiple languages, it's like let the rhythms of whatever language you're using take over your writing, and that's going to be your voice. Uh, as opposed to just kind of trying to craft it uh, too much. And then uh, also I would say, in general, I would say, uh, I think William Saroyan, who I mentioned earlier, who's the California writer from uh, Central California, he uh, he's not too very widely read nowadays, but uh, in his book, The Daring Young Man and the Flying Trapeze, uh, came out in the 20s I think or 30s he said something um, like if you're going to be a writer uh, really taste food when you eat it uh, really go out there when you uh, go out on a trip really go out on a voyage and when you when you get uh, angry get good angry so in other words have a very deep experience of life because that's going to save you Uh, if language doesn't save you at least having an interesting life will make your book interesting. I love that. Um, 
you've mentioned a few books, a few authors. Um, when you take the time to read for yourself, what are your go-to authors and genres? So, uh, you know, I say that my literary father is uh, the uh, Argentinian writer Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, who is a short story writer and very different from my writing, completely different. But uh, he sort of sustains me in a, in a way. I go back to him all the time. Uh, so he's one that I, that I read. I, um, I love uh, reading a lot of, well, I read a lot of poetry too. Uh, mostly a lot of modernist, you know, like T.S. Eliot. I read, I like Joan Didion also. I like her prose. I love her prose. I love uh, how she copied down like uh, Hemingway's sentences just to get a sense of Hemingway's craft. Like she copied down, uh, you know, handwritten, hand wrote a whole book, if I'm not mistaken. So I love Joan Didion's um, style. And uh, and then a few writers of, of friends of mine who are uh, around, uh, uh, Graydon Miller, who's uh, the 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 person who was the actor recording the book, is also a writer, and he's written a couple of great books, contemporary short stories. Uh, and my late friend Aldo Tambellini, who uh, was an artist but also a poet, that I ha I, re I really recommend uh, him. So those are some of the writers and a lot of the classics. Uh, you know, whether it be like uh, contemporary classics like Russians. Uh, love Russian literature, Dostoevsky, uh, Bulgakov, uh, stuff like that. And, uh, but yeah, like also, you know, like Shakespeare, all of, all of that stuff. Okay. Um, how about internet presence, website, any social media that you're active on, anything you would like to share? Um, yeah. So I, we are online at uh, 80 miles per hour. Um, on Facebook, I I don't know exactly the um, the the address, but I we do have a, a website for the for the book. It's uh, reggaetoncruise.net. So uh, reggaetoncruise.net. Uh, R e g g a e t o n cruise.net. And uh, you know there should be a lot of links there. And I'm on Amazon too. All my books are on Amazon, so you you guys can get them there and. Uh, also, some some uh, bookstores like Barnes Noble, I think, and local bookstores in LA, uh, like Book Soup. You can find some of my books there. All right, thank you, yeah. Patricia. We've talked about a variety of different things during our time together, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to highlight at this point? Um, you know, I just wanted to add something in terms of like advice to young writers because there's there's something that I want to say. Uh, that it's not only the big stuff, but also the small stuff that, that becomes very important for your writing. Like if you like um, sports, uh, you can incorporate that into your writing. If you like cooking, you can incorporate that into your writing. So all the little stuff is also important. So I'll leave you with that message that, uh, you know, it's not only the big stuff that matters, but the, the small stuff is almost more important because it gives you detail for writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of fills things in, fills in those, those wider gaps. Exactly. So, yeah, that's that's what I'd like to end with. And, you know, thank you very much. Sarah. Thank you a, so a much. Time. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. And take care. And yeah. keep on listening to the great podcast. I found a, a lot of uh, great uh, interviews that I'm, I'm going to keep listening to myself. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you once again to Patricio for joining me to talk about Reggaeton Cruz, also his poetry, his collection of essays, and just writing in general. I really appreciate it, as I said. I always appreciate when authors come on, and I really enjoy that I get to interview so many debut authors, debut novelists in this case. Um, not He's not a debut author, but you know what I mean? I get to read a lot of novels that are debut novels from authors. And so I get to be introduced to authors that are newer at this. Doesn't mean that they haven't been writing for a long time. Doesn't mean that they haven't written other novels or other stories. It just means that this is the first one that's been published. And it's very exciting to get to be a part of that in some small way, shape, or form. So thank you to Patricio. And thank you to all of the authors and especially debut authors who join me for this podcast. It is so much fun. And I know I say that a lot, but 
it is. And it's an honor to get to be a part of those authors' journeys. If you are um, intrigued at all by Rayaton Cruise, you should definitely check it out. It is available on Amazon. And actually, it's on Amazon right now on Kindle Unlimited. Is it unlimited? It is available on Kindle Unlimited, so you can get it there uh, if you have a Kindle Unlimited uh, I almost said prescription, <laughs> a Kindle Unlimited <laughs> subscription. It is available there, but otherwise you can get it in paperback or Kindle on Amazon. It is being developed as an audiobook, as you heard Patricio talk about. So I'm excited for that because I, as I said, there's so many different nationalities and accents and different types of people that that uh, narrator is going to get to bring to life. And I'm really intrigued to hear how that all comes about. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, and um, if you're a fan of this podcast, please do me the honor of liking, subscribing, following, doing all those wonderful things that will get you new episodes as soon as they come out. Also, if you haven't done so already and would like to do this, please leave us a review written or starred really helps us to get the podcast out to more people. Also follow on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I love hearing from listeners. I love hearing what you're reading, what you're thinking, what's going on in your world. Are you annoyed with the heat? <laughs> are you annoyed with how hot your home is right now? Or are you in an area of the world where you are not hot? Talk to me about the weather. Talk to me about books. Talk to me about whatever's going through your brain. I love to hear from listeners. Um, Hope your week is going really well so far. I can't wait to tell you all about London and that trip. It's going to be quick. It's just a long weekend, but so excited. We're going to visit friends and can't wait to share that experience with you. As I said, hope your week is going well, but I always hope how I always tell what I always tell you is that I hope no matter what's going on in your week, that your week, your days, your time involves plenty of of time to get yourself lost in as many good books as you possibly can. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.